for Law 1059. This is statutory interpretation, and now we're dealing with week eight material, which is extrinsic materials. Extrinsic materials are either something that you embrace or provide a legal headache. Um, so it's either something which is a, a rich source of material to you or a, quite an inconvenience. So I guess you need to decide what type of student are you when it comes to the issue of statutory interpretation. If you're the type that likes to get to the point quickly, find the answer and move on, which is great, um, the risk that you run in only looking at the intrinsic material is that you may have overlooked a potential argument. Now, it's probably fair to say that lawyers in practice find extrinsic materials generally a legal gold mine in the context of an important litigation case. Within the context of the day-to-day -day work that lawyers, and generally those that are not court-based, undertake extrinsic materials are a bit of a headache because they add a lot of extra time. Now, when I say a gold mine, I mean this, that in the event that you're arguing a case or trying to find a solution to a legal problem using statutory interpretation principles, extrinsic materials provide you with a whole range of potential arguments and authority for advancing certain arguments beyond that which you might find in the statutes or in the common law. So extrinsic materials are extensive, obviously, and they can assist you greatly. So you're arguing a case and you refer to extrinsic materials and the judge challenge you and says, well, you've referred me to a secondary source of the law. Why should I consider somebody else's opinion in making my decision? Here's where we need to have some answers ready to go. Um, in the common law sphere, I expect that you probably know which is the key section about the use of extrinsic materials in the interpretation of Commonwealth legislation. If you haven't found it, look to section 15, capital A, capital B of the Acts Interpretation Act. I'm going to go through it now, and I'd urge you to have this section in front of you as we discuss it. Now, subsection one is interesting because it provides for a preliminary phrase, one that we often see, and in my view, one that we should see more often, there are circumstances where we just don't see this type of phrase. Now, the phrase I'm talking about is subject to subsection, in this case, it's three. So subsection one of 15AB provides the general rule. It provides for the overriding exception in subsection three. Now, by phrasing it in that manner, what we glean is that if something fits within the other subsection, subsection three, then sub, subsection one will either not apply or it will be modified to the extent that's appropriate. We don't know that yet because we haven't read subsection three or well, you may have, and I hope you actually have. But um, the reason I say that this type of phrase, in my view, should be used more often than it is in statutory um, drafting is that on occasion, I find that when I read a section and then read a different section within the same act, the two don't sit neatly together. And I'm asking myself questions which is the dominant provision? Which is the subservient provision? When do I apply this section? When do I apply the other section? If the drafters of the legislation had a clear intention in mind that one should apply in certain circumstances to the exclusion of the other or vice versa, 
or one should apply in priority to the other, it would seem to me it would be of great assistance to those people who read legislation if that included something like subject to subsection three. That makes it much easier to read and, and it helps to answer the ambiguity of the problem that I have. For example, um, does section 37, I'm off the top of my head of the Domestic and Family Violence and Protection Act 2016, does that principle apply in circumstances where a temporary protection order is sought where the respondent has been served? Have a look at that as an exercise, come up with an answer. Anyway, back to section 15AB of the common law. Subject to subsection three, how do we interpret an act? How do we use extrinsic materials in the interpretation of an act? And it says in the interpretation of a provision of an act, if any material which does not form part of the act is capable of assisting in the ascertaining, uh, ascertainment of the meaning of the provision, consideration may be given to that material in a number of ways. So when the judge says to you, why should I consider someone else's opinion? And you're dealing with the interpretation of common with the legislation. You say, Your Honour, the Acts Interpretation Act, Section 15AB, specifically provides that in these circumstances, you may give consideration to extrinsic material for one of a number of stated purposes. You have the legislative authority to do so. All right, well, let's move on. What else have you got to say, says the judge. So when can you use the extrinsic materials in that context? Well, one is to confirm the meaning of a provision is the ordinary meaning conveyed by the text, considering its context in the act and the purpose or object underlying that act. What's well, a lot of words, but what it means is that um, if you want to confirm that which you believe to be the ordinary meaning, you can use extrinsic materials to assist you in that regard. But you must do so with, within the general principles of considering the context and the purpose or the object underlying the act, which is a little circular because if you think about it, in order to use extrinsic materials to confirm the ordinary meaning by reference to the context and the purpose or object of the act, you then ask yourself the question, well, how do I best go about determining the purpose or the object underlying the act, for example? Well, as we've determined, the starting point would be to consider appropriate intrinsic materials, such as the definition section or the objects clause. But then we should also consider extrinsic materials to determine the purpose or the object underlying the act. So therefore, we need to consider extrinsic materials to determine the purpose or the object underlying the act, which is the precondition for using extrinsic materials to confirm the meaning of the provision is the ordinary meaning. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, that's the first basis upon which the use of extrinsic materials may be considered. The second is to determine the meaning of the provision in some circumstances. Number one, when the provision is ambiguous or obscure. So what does that mean? You're trying to determine the meaning of the act, the interpretation of a provision. The section says you can go to extrinsic material if in trying to determine that meaning, the provision is ambiguous or obscure. So when you read something, there is, a, there is a temptation to simply read it the way you want it to, to read. And so I urge you, when you're reading legislation critically, when you're analysing it, when you're mounting an argument, knowing that your opponent will be looking at the same section and attempting to mount a counter-argument, 
you need to allow for the possibility that even though at first glance it's clear, if you think it through more thoroughly, particularly if you look at it from the perspective of your opponent, then suddenly that which appears to be clear may become a little ambiguous or a little obscure because you're considering it from a different perspective. And law's a lot like that. You need to take off the blinkers and look at it in broader context. We talked about that last week. Or you can use the extrinsic materials to determine the meaning of the provision when the ordinary meaning, taking into account the context and the purpose or object underlying the act, leads to a result that is manifestly absurd or is unreasonable. So when you advance an argument for this being the appropriate interpretation of a word or a phrase, you can expect it to be the subject of testing to ensure that that which you advance as the appropriate argument is reasonable within a wider context and that it doesn't lead to absurd results within a wider context. I mentioned last week, judges will, and you, you can see it every day in courts. When there's an argument about how something should be interpreted, judges will then say, all right, well, if you're advancing that argument and you say this occurs, tell me, does your potential meaning stand up in this scenario or in these circumstances? And that's what you need to consider doing when you're interpreting an act, when you're advancing an argument based on an interpretation of the act, think about how your interpretation would work in a different context to ensure that the result is not absurd or unreasonable. I hope that makes sense. All right, so in section 15AB, that's the basic rule. You can use extrinsic materials when it comes to statutory interpretation for a number of reasons. I said that was subject to subsection three, so we're still gonna to get to that. That'll either provide an exception or a modification to the general rule. Now, as is often the case in modern drafting, the drafters of the legislation will set out the general proposition as clearly and as succinctly as possible, but then later provide some further elaboration. Now, I'll contrast that plain English drafting style that we see in section 15AB, which I think is a very well drafted piece of legislation, to that which was the case 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago, or even 30 years ago um, in law, where when you'd read, for example, a mortgage or a lease or even legislation, it was a bunch of words, often many lines, and often without any obvious sentences. In other words, one sentence, which was something like determining legislation, whether that be, you know, um, whether or not it's obscure or ambiguous, et cetera, et cetera. The person interpreting the legislation may have recourse to the documents in the uh, Act itself or relevant reports of a Royal Commission or Law Reform Commission or reports of committee, treaties, expanded. In other words, that was all listed out as part of the overall sentence. It becomes very hard to read. And we used to typically use highlighters when they, when they came in to highlight the important parts, leaving aside the examples and, and the um, uh, further explanations that were contained within that section. So we could actually read the important parts as a sentence by following the yellow highlighting. I hope that makes sense. So we don't do that now. Section 15AB sets out subsection one, the general proposition, and then subsection two says, without limiting the general nature of that which is contained in subsection one, the material, extrinsic material that you can use in, in the interpretation, 
of a provision includes a whole range of things, and I rattle off a few of them earlier. Matters not forming part of the Act that are set out in the document containing the text of the Act as printed by the government printer. Any relevant reports of a Royal Commission, Law Reform Commission, Committee of Inquiry or similar body. Any relevant report of a Committee of the Parliament of either House of Parliament, whether that was made to Parliament before the time when the provision was enacted or not. Um, well, really before it was enacted. Any treaty or international agreement, any explanatory memorandum in the common law sphere or note in the state sphere or other relevant documents furnished to members of either of the houses before the time when the provision was enacted. The speech made to a house by a member of parliament or the minister rather on the occasion by that minister of a motion that the bill be read a second time in the house, the second reading speech or any document declared by the act to be a relevant document or any relevant material in the journals of the Senate votes proceedings of the House of Representatives, official record of parliament debates in parliament, Hansard or other houses. Okay, so what's the value of subsection two? Well, it provides you with a really great place to start to look for extrinsic materials if you're not otherwise aware of where to look. So if you're really doing the job properly in seeking to interpret the provisions of an act, then if it fits within the general principle in, in subsection one of 15AB, you would look to section 15, uh, subsection two, uh, sorry, 15AB2 to provide some better explanation. But remember, read the entire act uh, first. All right, so what's the exception in subsection three? Subsection three says, in determining whether consideration should be given to any material in accordance with subsection one, or in considering the weight that should be good to that, given to that material, regard should be had to any other relevant matters, being the desirability of being able to read and rely upon the ordinary meaning considering the context and the purpose or object and the need to avoid prolonging legal or other proceedings without compensating advantage. We mentioned this in week one. It's that, that distinction between how far do we go? Um, it would drive you mad if you went and looked at every piece of extrinsic material that may be relevant to a piece of legislation. So the government is saying, look, these things are available, but let's keep it within that which is appropriate to what is being determined. Now it's a bit like the Brigginshaw test, as I think I mentioned earlier. Now, in Queensland, the relevant section is 14B, which deals specifically with the issue of the extrinsic materials and in interpretation. And it's a little similar but not the same as the Commonwealth counterpart. Now, of course, the basic issue that we see from time to time is this. If you're given a problem and it's based on Commonwealth legislation or say Queensland legislation, don't quote the wrong section of the Acts Interpretation Act. In other words, if you're dealing with a Queensland section, and you wish to advance arguments about extrinsic materials, quote 14B of the Queensland Acts Interpretation Act. If you're dealing with federal legislation, don't quote the Queensland legislation, quote the federal legislation, quote 15AB for the use of extrinsic materials. Because while they're the same uh, in overall nature, the wording's different. Now, in 14B, the Queensland legislation says, subject to subsection two, the interpretation of a provision in, in interpreting a provision, consideration may be given to extrinsic materials. But instead of two bases, there's now three. Number one is if the provision is ambiguous or obscure to provide an interpretation, well, that's the same as Commonwealth. B, 
if the ordinary meaning leads to a result that's manifestly absurd or unreasonable to provide for an interpretation that avoids that result, which is similar. But then there's also three. In any other case, to confirm the interpretation conveyed by the ordinary meaning of the provision. So if the judge says to you, why should I consider extrinsic materials? Why is this relevant for me? And it's a Queensland case. You know, you're not limited to the first two arguments. You can say in any case, it's necessary to confirm the interpretation conveyed by the ordinary meaning of the provision. Um, again, subsection two in, in 14b is similar to subsection three in 15ab in that it talks about the use of extrinsic materials and the discrepancy between the desirability of determining the ordinary meaning, the undesirability of prolonging proceedings, but it also includes a third matter, and that is any other relevant matters. Subsection three, which is the counterpart of subsection two in the Commonwealth legislation, provides what we mean by extrinsic materials and sets out a number of examples, which you'll see are quite similar to the common law counterpart. All right. Um, it's always useful in interpretation of legislation to have some go-to cases and some go-to sections. We've mentioned a couple of important sections already. Um, but do consider some cases that are highly significant in this area of practice. One that I refer to often is Mills and Meeking, 1991-69-CLR-214. Now, within the context of this area of practice, the High Court said if the language is clear and the purpose is stated in the Act, there may be no cause to refer to extrinsic materials. Now, bear in mind that the Commonwealth legislation is of a more limited extent to the Queensland legislation. So those comments in Mills and Meeking may, in your view, be more apposite when there's an argument to do with Commonwealth legislation than would be the case where there's an argument about Queensland-based legislation. But... Even though the Act talks about the potential for considering the interpretation in certain circumstances, remember that you must always do this, and this is actually in 15AB and, and 14B, you must also do this within the context of the legislation. And if we look at the decision of CIC Insurance and Bankstown Football Club, 1997-187-CLR-384, we'll see the High Court commentary that context is designed to be used in its widest sense in that regard. So have a look at that section and consider how that may apply in your circumstances. That'll do for this session. Um, continue reading your text. Please continue to consider the problems that are presented to you on a weekly basis in a critical and a manner and analyse those. And when I say analyse, you're looking for that which is missing or that which may be an approach adopted by an opponent. Think about that within the context of your conclusions to ensure that what you come up with as the answer is appropriate and consistent with other pieces of legislation and consistent with the, the law generally. All right, so that's it for extrinsic materials. I'll speak to you soon.